Hey everybody, Chris from Military Aviation History and I am today at the Swedish Air Force Museum in Linköping, Sweden, of course. Now, big thank you here, of course, to all the patrons and channel members who make Inside the Cockpit happen and of course also to the museum for allowing us access to this magnificent aircraft, the JA-37DI Vegan. Now, the museum currently is renovating, which means that we are in their storage hangar where we have a fantastic access to a lot of unique Swedish machines. So veterans of the Inside the Cockpit series, of course, know what's going to happen now. I'm going to treat the outside of Vegan with some love, taking you all the way around the aircraft, uh, around the wing, then all around the tail, of course, finishing it up on the port side. And then we are, of course, going to jump inside. And this is, of course, your friendly reminder that if you have an aviation museum in your neighborhood, go there, support them. And of course, also, when you come to Sweden, visit the Finnish, Air, uh, not the Finnish, the Swedish Air Force Museum. The Finnish Air Force Museum, by the way, is also very good. But also definitely visit the Swedish Air Force Museum uh, because you find really some very unique aircraft here. Now, starting on the nose, of course, we have uh, the pitot tube. And then in the radom, we find the PS 46A radar set. This is a Paul Stoppler multi-mode radar, which operates in the X-band. Now, we again DI that is behind me. is essentially the last main variant of the Vegan series, and it is optimized as an air interceptor, of course, in the air-to-air -air role. Now, Vegan comes in many shapes and sizes with also some ground attack elements attached to it. But for this video, I'm going to mainly focus on that DI variant uh, with the, of course, air-to-air -air weaponry. Coming a little bit more forward towards the cockpit then, that we of course see over there, we have the twin nose wheel incorporating of course also some steering and we have a landing light there as well. The avionics compartment behind the radar also houses all the INS uh, software, so the International uh, Inertial Navigation System. You have uh, the Doppler radar nav set in there and everything that the pilot, of course, required is required for him to operate the aircraft. Speaking about the operation of the aircraft, it wouldn't be complete without an engine, of course. So we have a Volvo Aero RM8B in the aircraft. That is essentially a Pratt & Whitney JT8D. And in this last variant of Vegan, which is an aircraft that actually required quite a lot of power, it has a very magnificent power plant in there, of course, uh, you're getting uh, roughly 15,000 pounds of force in dry and 24,000 pounds of force if you go full afterburner. Looking then towards these canards. Now these canards are fixed and you might recognize them from other aircraft, for example, like uh, Gripen or Rafale, uh, Mirage, Eurofighter Typhoon. But in some of those aircraft, those can be all moving. This one is definitely fixed, but there is a moving element, of course, in the back with a canard flap. Now what these do, first of all, they're close coupled, which means that they're set just above and forward of the main wing. They create then these uh, vortexes or vortices that then also interact with the vortices on the wing and that prevents sort of the separation of the airflow uh, from being carried on throughout the wingspan of the aircraft. And that of course then prevents prevents at certain deflections or at certain angles of attacks and at certain speeds a loss of lift and of course the stall that follows that. What is also happening here is that because of the flaps uh, it helps a lot with takeoff. Um, so basically double delta or delta wing aircraft have this issue with down thrust on takeoff and this compensates that by producing a lot of uh, additional lift and getting that up thrust instead. The museum has also kindly opened this compartment here. We see this, for, of course, for the ground crew. We have a section here for the armament and, of course, a couple of circuit breakers there as well. Coming then towards the wing, as you know, in Inside the Cockpit, I'm always doing the weapon systems on the port side. So let's talk about the main wing for now. It is sort of a double delta design because it, the, the sweep angle does change at the point where the gear sits just about here. But before I go along the wing, uh, the leading edge towards the wing tip, let's just briefly talk about the spine of the aircraft. You see a couple of antennas there. That's also for your radio uh, systems. But specifically what we have in Vegan are 12,000 pounds of fuel. The main tank is a saddle tank. So that means it sits above the main engine that is of course uh, situated in the center line of the aircraft. 
You have two additional fuel tanks slightly forward of that to either side of the aircraft, uh, just about where the canard sit, and then you have an additional fuel tank just behind the cockpit. And then of course in the wing on the leading edge and in the towards the trailing edge, you also find two additional wing tanks. Now let's walk towards the uh, the wingtip here, and on the way we will find this. Now this is a dog tooth, of course creating a vortex once again in order to prevent that separation of the airflow to occur but specifically in vegan it also houses a radar warning receiver for the uh, forward part of the aircraft on either side of course providing some of that protection uh, for the aircraft now turning then towards the wingtip we also have this sort of uh, this wing extension here that is slightly curved which is nice we have the navigational lights and then of course we come to the elements we have an outboard element and an inboard element and these are deflected hydraulically uh, with the actuator rams uh, of course corresponding to the pilot's input now the way the camera is set up right now you're probably going to wonder where is the tail well vegan is a tailless aircraft that actually means only that there is no horizontal stabilizer. There is a vertical stabilizer, but it can be, as you can see, cranked downwards in order to be housed in those protective bunkers that Sweden built. And also, of course, sometimes they have mountain bunkers and so on. Um, and that's how you would do it. On the actual tail, you will find, of course, uh, uh, several systems like, for example, radio antennas and radar warning receivers as well. So those would be housed there. Now, moving then towards this tail area, uh, there is a uh, air brake that sits in the fuselage. We're gonna get some better footage of that just to show you. But then we come to perhaps one of the most exciting aspects of Gripen if we take the camera and just show this part. Um, yes, Gripen, uh, sorry, not Gripen, Vegan features thrust reversing. Basically what would happen is of course, Sweden has this, um, this policy of using their aircraft, of course, on prepared runways, but also having these dispersal sites throughout the countries on main roads and highways. There used to be about 100. I think nowadays that has gone down to sort of 40 or 30. Uh, the official number is, well, different than probably the actual number. Um, but these are very short runways. Generally speaking, the uh, criteria there is 16 by 800 meters. And in order to land a big plane like Vegan, you need thrust reversing. So this was installed here. These flaps deploy automatically to, in order to give that thrust reversing and then he gives it full power just for a second on this bad boy here and then he comes to a standstill. And also it allows Vegan to reverse, which is quite nice on these very narrow streets and uh, corners where the aircraft would then be uh, set up and turned around for another sortie. Let's go towards then of course, uh, actually here we can have a very nice look at of course the uh, retracted or not retracted, the sideways uh, stored uh, tail fin. Uh, we've got a pressure sensor up front and of course the antenna on top of that as well. Let's move then towards the wingtip on the port side. We've got of course the navigational lighting as you would expect. And then there's a Lanson over there. We've got a couple of videos coming up on that as well. And let's now talk about the weapon system that a vegan can carry. Now on the outboard pylon here, we find mainly AIM-9, so RB-24 or rather uh, 74 in the upgraded variant of uh, the sign rider that could be stored here. Sweden, of course, has their own designation for all these air-to-air -air missiles and IR homing missiles have an even number and of course are uh, preset with that RB designation, which means the robot, so missile in Swedish. But you could also mount here our chaff dispensers or rather the protection system, so REMS or BOL, and that uh, deploys chaff or flare, uh, flares in order to protect the aircraft against IR or uh, missiles or of course radar missiles. Then coming to the mid-wing pylon, uh, this is uh, used also for AIM-9s, so RB-24 or 74, or in fact with the D variant, AMRAMs were added as well. So the AIM-120, which is RB-99, of course, radar homing missile, or as we can see here, we also previously to that had Skyflash RB-71. This is a mock-up here for, from the museum. So then coming, of course, towards the inboard pylon, that is situated more towards the training edge of the wing. That's also where additional countermeasure systems could be housed, uh, such as the Remsor Boy. 
And then looking at this area, of course, we have an additional uh, centerline pylon that is also mirrored on the other side of the aircraft. And this is where additional air-to-air -air missiles could be uh, installed. And of course, we have the RAT here, the Ram Air Turbine, which also provides that emergency power to the electronical and to the electric and the hydraulic system that Vegan requires, of course, in order to get back onto the ground. We find a fuel tank, roughly 3,000 pounds of additional fuel. And we, of course, have the main gun of Vegan coming in this conformal pod. You see the muzzle over here. And of course, we have a cooling air intake for that gun over here. Vegan carries a 30 millimeter Oregon KCA gun, which fires a 100 by, no, 30 by 173 millimeter shell, which makes it as a 30 millimeter gun substantially, let's say, more destructive than comparable guns, such as Aden or Defa guns. It also fires at roughly 1,350 rounds per minute, which is a lower rate of fire than com compared to those, uh, the, the other guns, which is in air combat perhaps not the best, uh, best thing to have, but it also has a higher muscle velocity, so it compensates a little bit there. And of course, it has that additional oomph as well on impact, roughly 150 rounds are carried in the aircraft and that gives the pilot roughly 66 to 7 seconds of fire. Now some reflector stripes here as well but that brings us to a close on the outside so I'm now going to be jumping inside of the cockpit and before that I'm just going to celebrate one take and let's go. So now sitting inside of Egan I have to say it looks like a remarkably well put together cockpit. There's a couple of dials here and there that are a little bit hard to notice uh, from where I'm sitting, but for the rest, it looks very well thought out with everything where you would expect it. And of course, a couple of heads down displays as well that came with the modernization process of Vegan. Vegan was also used as a test bed, or like the last versions of Vegan were used as a test bed for a lot of stuff that was carried over into Gripen. So you'd expect some things in here uh, perhaps were not in use during the majority of its service life. But we will go through that in detail, of course, now starting as always on the port side, working our way towards the front instrument dashboard and then uh, looking at, of course, the starboard side and finishing it off there with the stick. And uh, yeah, let's just get started. As always, I will go through the cockpit's detail from the left to the right. Since this is a JA-37DI, various elements of this aircraft have been modified repeatedly from the initial D variant. This is not an issue, but there are one or two changes that I'm not 100% on. I point these out as we go along, so if you are Swedish or have information, package that into a nice little comment for all of us to learn more. Now, let's get started, as always, on the port side. On the far left, the larger lever is the gear control. It is surprisingly far out considering the more traditional placements up front and to the left. To the outside of this is the automatic throttle control lever. The interior lighting control panel sits in front of this, followed by the radio communications panel. To the outside of that, the emergency trim switches for roll, pitch and yaw. Then we come to the radar panel with its control stick. To the outside of that, we find the big red canopy jettison button and startup switches for generators and electrical power over to the low pressure fuel valve and the ignition switches. Another radio control panel is in front of this. And then the throttle, which sits just above the radar control stick. The throttle sits on a rail with your usual idle to military power motion range over to the push over into afterburner. The first switch is the automatic throttle control selector. A countermeasure switch sits just out of view to the foreside of the throttle grip. To the side we have a vertical adjuster for weapons use and above this the radar mode selector. Forward turns on the radar and backwards it is off. The weapon select switch is found on top of that. Up for guns, down for missiles. The top hat switch is for the U95 jamming port antenna. The hat switch below that is a backup. The remaining switches are, from what I understand, the control switches for the jammer port. Let's now go to the instruments that sit towards the front of the starboard console. On the outside you will find, from the front, the cabin and brake pressure indicator, and then the pitch trim indicator. Then the left warning panel. This one is primarily linked to the engine, fuel and hydraulic systems. 
Coming to the front instrument panel, we have the main flight instruments set to the left side with the heads down displays and the engine instruments in the center and right. The arrangement in the DI is a lot different than in the Vegan D as the right heads down display doubled in size and thus other panels and gauges had to be moved. From the left we find the standby attitude indicator over the altimeter and the backup altimeter. Above the main attitude indicator we have the accelerometer to the left of the speedometer that also has an integrated Mach counter. The angle of attack indicator is on the top. Below all of this, this vegan has an engine RPM indicator and an engine pressure ratio indicator to the right. These were actually moved over here from the earlier D versions where some of this information would be displayed to the right hand side of the instrument panel. We have then a central heads down display. This is the target display. The primary use is for course and attitude and anti-collision warning. And above all this, you of course find your heads up display. To the right and top, a heading indicator. And then the second larger head down display below this is the tactical display. This is primarily used for navigation, aircraft position reference, target and location markers. However, based on the discrepancy between what this aircraft has equipped and what it says in the manual for the normal D version, I assume that this display might also have additional function as the DI was also used as a test bed for some of the stuff that was then integrated into Gripen. A fuel tank indicator and clock are offset to the right of all of this. On the starboard side, we find your right warning lights panel. This is primarily linked to your avionics. The indicators below this are the exhaust temperature, that's to the left, and the variable exhaust nozzle indicator. Then the navigational data indicator and selector panel. This allows you to switch between different navigational information on your current position, waypoint coordinates, airbase headings, time to target, and so on. The switch and keypad attached to it allows the pilot to switch between input and output of data selection. To the outside, the navigational panel with waypoint push points and what I assume to be the ILS, so the Instrument Landing System Channel Selector. The weapons panel sits above all of this, having been moved from the front instrument board. Then on the top row, various fuel system related switches from the front, we have the manual fuel regulator and the control switch, followed by the fuel pump switch, and then we have the manual afterburner fuel regulator. Further to the rear, the switches are for the backup generator, the pitch gear, and the engine deicer. Returning to the lower instrument panel, in a row we have the countermeasure and uh, jamming control panel, the communications panel, and to the rear the external lighting panel followed by the IFF switches. To the outside of this, the windscreen deicer switch, followed by the systems testing panel, and then we come to the controls for the flares and the chaff, respectively the left and the right switch there, and then to the top of that, a couple of circuit breakers. Coming now to the flight stick, we have an overall conventional layout. The stick is used for pitch and roll control, while the rudder panels obviously provide your control. In the middle, we have your weapon safety, which covers the IR seeker release and also holds the safety for the main trigger. To its left, the trim switches, to its right, the autopilot disconnect. Slightly below that, we have the altitude hold button. And to the side of the stick, we have two buttons. The topmost button is your radio transmit button, and the lower one is the optical mode select for your displays. And then behind the stick, in the usual spot, we have the trigger switch. Right, and that brings us to a close in the cockpit. Big thank you here, of course, to the Swedish Air Force Museum for giving us this fantastic access to their machine. And a massive thank you also to all the patrons and channel members who make Inside the Cockpit and this channel possible. All the relevant links are, of course, to both the museum and the support options in the description below. So if you like this content, first of all, go to aviation museums because that's where you see these museums. And of course, consider supporting the channel. As always, I wish all of you a great day and see you in the sky.